Hello, everybody. This is Doug Reeves broadcasting from Boston, and it's a delight to have you join us today for a webinar on reducing failures right now. What I want to share with you is some evidence literally just in the last few weeks uh, that is the culmination of evidence that I've gathered over the course of months and even years about how you can make a difference to improve student learning. And I want to encourage you that if you'll stay with me for this webinar, you'll walk away with ideas that literally this semester, this year, you can reduce failures. And you'll see it because other people around the country, or indeed around the world, have been doing so. I want to greet all of our listeners here as well as around the world. Uh, in Europe, bonsoir. In Asia and Australia, go back to bed. It's three o'clock in the morning there. So give yourself a break. You can always listen to this uh, on tape later on. And by the way, that reminds me that we always record these. We always make our webinars available as free downloads. And if you find this information of use, I'm also willing to have free video conferences uh, with you and your colleagues. You have the contact information down there uh, before you. So please take advantage of it. You can tweet at Douglas Reeves. You can call me directly. That's my international dial uh, on the screen. Uh, for those of you listening by phone, I'll just give it to you. That's 1-781-710-9633. Or you can find quite a number of resources at creativeleadership.net. That's where you'll find uh, short videos, articles, research, uh, as well as tools such as the Leadership Performance Matrix, all available for free. And we really hope that you'll take advantage of that and tell your friends and colleagues about it. Uh, a couple of things that I want to make sure we do, although we rely on electronic communication a great deal with this today's webinar, there's no substitute for face-to-face -face communication. And so I want to invite you personally to join us at the Creative Leadership Summit in Boston this June. That's June 26th, 27th, and 28th, 2019. It will be in Boston's Back Bay at the Sheraton uh, within literally stepping stones of historic Copley Square uh, within a couple of blocks of the uh, wonderful public garden in Boston Common, the Freedom Trail, and of course, Cheers. Uh, all the other things that you'll look forward to. If you walk in the other direction, you'll find Fenway Park. And just across the river, of course, you'll find Harvard Square, uh, the University, MIT, and a number of other great places. Uh, we really think June is a lovely time of year to be here and hope that you'll consider joining us. I should tell you also uh, that it's not just a tourist excursion. You're going to have some great professional learning. Uh, for example, uh, from Singapore, Dr. Chip Kimball will be joining us speaking about courageous leadership. Dr. Jennifer Price uh, the leader of one of literally the world's most innovative schools, Buckingham Brown in Nichols. Uh, Roger Leone, the uh, superintendent of one of the great turnarounds, Newark Public Schools uh, in the United States, indeed around the world. Um, Glenn Malenko, who has overseen a increase in a few years of high school graduation from 68% to 95%, all the while serving a growing population of English language learners, as well as, of course, my wonderful colleagues, at Creative Leadership Solutions. There's going to be a lot of great information that I hope you'll consider joining us for, as well as opportunities for just informal question and answer and, and discussion. You'll see the QR code on your screen here, or you can just go to creativeleadership.net and uh, learn more about this great event. Um, also, speaking of free resources, I've just in the last few days had a number of people tell me that the teacher pipeline is down, not only in the, in the US, but I was speaking to a friend in the Gulf states saying that for international schools, finding and keeping teachers is one of their greatest single challenges. On a strategic plan for an independent school, I saw the same thing just yesterday. So consider this article that I wrote for Ed Leadership called Restoring the Teacher Pipeline and the Profession. And in there, I in include seven keys for what we need to do as leaders and as policymakers to have people come to and remain in our profession and at our schools. And interestingly, number seven is money. So money's important, but money's not enough. It requires all manner of other elements of professional environment if we want to attract and keep teachers. A student achievement and teacher evaluations, uh, some really interesting uh, insights by my colleague, uh, Kim Marshall. And by the way, if you're not subscribing to the Marshall Memo, please be sure you do so. Uh, go to Marshall Memo, that's Marshall with two L's, marshallmemo.com. And even if you don't subscribe, you'll find uh, some of the best teacher evaluation uh, and observation rubrics out there. Uh, for leaders, the Leadership Performance Matrix, also available for free at creativeleadership.net, the result of a 37-state study uh, that I conducted 
And I think it's a great way to uh, identify, develop, and evaluate and, um, and promote leaders in the future. And of course, all the slides from today's presentations will be available as well. Uh, one more thing, if you've got friends who part of their New Year's resolution is to finish that dissertation, send them to finishthedissertation.org. It's free and non-commercial support. We help doctoral candidates all around the world. Just last Monday, one of our students successfully defended, and we wanna make sure that we support you. We now uh, have uh, students in doctoral programs all around the world. If you, a friend or a loved one, a colleague, are stuck in our dissertation, send them to finishthedissertation.org. We'll be happy to help. So for today, here are the keys for reducing failures right now. Focus, feedback, engagement, and decision clarity. That's focus, feedback, engagement, and decision clarity. You get these four things right, you'll be able to reduce feedback, uh, reduce failure rather, immediately. Uh, let's begin with some brand new evidence. These are things that I've collected around the country and I'll just share them uh, with you very briefly. High schools where failures are down dramatically, down 60%, uh, even more in, in other cases. And the need for intervention also declined because as they have effective interventions, that is getting a handle on missing work every single day of the week, not waiting for progress reports, not waiting for failures at the end of the semester, but every day they have dramatically fewer failures. Middle schools are doing the same thing with not only improving uh, failures, but also uh, having a decrease in absences and most importantly, a decrease in suspensions. This is really important that every time at the secondary level, when we have better academic achievement, we also wind up with better behavior, better culture. You have colleagues who are resistant to reform and they say, what's in this for me? Why should I do it? How about better student behavior, better climate, better culture? Indeed, at elementary schools, we're also seeing better reading proficiency as well as absences down substantially. It's important to note that all these things took place without changing students, teachers, curriculum, budgets, anything else. It's all about your decision making, and that's what we're going to learn about today. The magic formula, there is no magic formula. It's all about your professional practices. You're not gonna hear a single program mentioned today. It's all about our professional practices. And what I found in common that these had was immediate same day or same week intervention. They don't wait. A lot of people spend millions of dollars on Saturday school, on after school, on summer school. Don't wait. These successful schools are intervening every single day. In fact, when it comes to attendance, it's not just the same day, it's the same minute. They literally are standing in the principal's office 60 seconds after the tardy bell rings, calling every single student who's not there, whether they're absent or whether they're tardy, and getting them in school. Now, I know that sounds like a big hassle, but it's not nearly as much of a hassle as students failing. So intervening immediately, same day, same minute, really works. So a great recommendation from Daniel Pink. Uh, many of you I know read his work and I'm sure you read his book, Drive, The Science of Human Motivation. His newest book is called Time, uh, or, or called When, and that's the scientific secrets of perfect timing. For example, take math in the morning, you have achievement that is the same as having higher income parents or extra weeks of schools. When you take math courses in the first two periods of the day, you have better GPAs, better scores and state assessments. I know a lot of people are stuck in a rotating schedule and at the same time they'll say, but our biggest challenge is low math scores. If you wanna work on math scores, do math in the morning. Uh, recess, it's absolutely essential. And if you're stuck where Kids who get lots of support at home get recess, and kids who don't get support at home are held in and get remediation. That is a really bad decision. It's one of the single worst things that schools are doing. Essentially, poor kids get remediation, rich kids get recess, and I'm telling you, every single student needs recess. They need fresh air, they need to get out of their seats. You have a pressure cooker happening if those students are still sitting there without a break from eight o'clock in the morning until 2.30 in the afternoon, they need a break. And some of the kids that are being denied recess are the ones who most need it right now. Now, let's turn our attention to a really unpopular recommendation. And again, blame Daniel Pink, don't blame me, I'm just the messenger here. Uh, imagine this, 80% uh, 
of high schools refuse to implement a remedy that would reduce depression, suicide, obesity, substance abuse, even car crashes, man, wouldn't you be upset if they learned that this was possible, but 80% refused to do it? And, and what if this remedy was beneficial for the adults as well? And what if it was endorsed by the American Pediatric Association? And all these things would be great, but people simply refuse to do it. Here's the miracle cure that nobody wants. Start the high school day after 8.30 in the morning. When you do that, you get better attendance, fewer tardies, dramatic reduction in car crashes, and better achievement. But nobody likes to do it. Well, they say it costs too much. The Brookings Institution and our friends at Wake County, North Carolina, which includes, interestingly, rural and urban and suburban areas, have already analyzed this and found that the late start was better than any other educational initiative that was available to them as policymakers. What about rigor? Well, all I can say is the Air Force Academy, a pretty rigorous place, did a study comparing early start to late start. The late start had better physical and academic performance. And what about football? You know, we've, we've got to have an early start because the football team needs to practice. Okay, I grant that. Get them lights. They probably already have it anyway. And all I can say is Oklahoma, where they take football seriously, had a state champion that had a late start. So I don't want to hear it can't be done. I don't want to hear it's unpopular. It's just one of the best things you can do. And you ought to ask yourself if you could have fewer car crashes, less obesity, stress, anxiety, and depression, why wouldn't you do it? Now, how can you make change happen in this year? Here are some things that my friends in Newark and around the country are doing. And that is what we call the, the learning exposition, a simple three panel board where the left panel is my challenge, the middle panel is my intervention, the right hand panel is my results. And let me share you, with you what they're doing because I think in this wonderful district as well as systems around the country, what they're finding is people distrust external evidence. They've had all the usual suspects come in and say, do this, do that, all based on evidence that doesn't really resonate with local teachers. But when they created their own locally based evidence with these simple three panel display boards, well, look at what they found. Here are some examples. Here's a high school of about 1,100 kids where they had 385 failures in grades nine through 12, almost all of it due to missing work. They started catch up Fridays. And what happened? Look at the right hand side of this simple three panel display. They went from 385 failures to 15 failures. They increased their electives because they didn't have so many repeaters. They improved their attendance. They had a 55% reduction in high school suspensions. This stuff really worked all because they had catch up Fridays. But that's just one idea. Here's another one. Oops. Um, these are math students who weren't explaining story problems well. And, and many of you who have looked at your math, math data not only know that low math scores are a vexing problem, but one of the reasons for it is that the constructed response part, that is the story problems, take more time to answer, count more points, and when kids don't get it right, it really drags their scores down. So all these teachers did was to model complete problem solving, showing detail by detail, step by step what it looked like. And then they were able to show their student performance from fall to winter to spring, the same student to the same student could see their elaborate math problem solving getting more and more detailed. You can see it with your own eyes. You don't have to look at a graph or a chart. Watch the individual student work. Here's another math example of a 62% failure rate that went down all the way to 18%. What did they do? A couple of simple changes in the grading system. They changed from using the average to the latest and best evidence. And those of you who are watching this, who have not yet calculated semester grades, if you would simply stop using the average and use instead the latest and best evidence, you will have fewer Ds and Fs. They stopped grading homework because homework was reflecting not so much what the students knew, but what the parents knew. And they changed to doing the work during the class time. Now, we assign homework because students need practice. That's true. But the practice that they get in homework doesn't meet any kind of standard for effective practice. Effective practice requires feedback and coaching and differentiation. That never happens with homework. And so they started doing the practice during the class. Was it perfect? No. They just went from 68% DF rate 
to 18%. Pretty darn good. Here's a social studies teacher who went from 120 failures to 38 failures. Not perfect, but still a dramatic improvement. She was making immediate intervention calls every single week to home, to remind students. And some parents appreciated it. Some parents hung up on her. Some parents wouldn't answer. Some parents cussed her out. She did it anyway. And look at the results. So those are the sort of things that you can do. I'm just giving you realistic examples. Now let's get to the big evidence of our four areas for today. Focus, feedback, engagement, and decision clarity. Let us begin with focus. Now, many of you know the research that I've published on this subject for more than 2,000 schools that showed essentially that uh, when we have six or fewer instructional and leadership initiatives, we have better gains in student achievement. What I want to notice right now, though, is that talking about focus isn't good enough because here's a senior administrator who is a friend of mine and a thoughtful person, <coughs> pardon me, who believed that he had focus in these areas. But when we asked his teachers what their initiatives were, here's what the teacher said. So thinking that you've got focus isn't enough. You've got to ask your teachers and be willing to pull out root and branch some of these initiatives that have gathered year after year after year. I know a principal, for example, who put limits in the copy machine because 20-year-old worksheets were still being used. So the principal thought that she had focus, but in fact, the teachers in the classroom were continuing to be fragmented all over the map. So of all the things that you've got to have for success, these are the things that are most important. Efficacy, the bone deep belief that we matter as teachers and leaders. Hey, that doesn't mean that poverty and second language and all these other things are irrelevant. It just means that you matter more. And our efficacy, the efficacy that John Hattie has talked about, that Robert Marzano has talked about, that Michael Fullen has talked about, and indeed that my quantitative research of more than 2,000 schools talks about, efficacy really matters. Prioritization. In writing the foreword for this book, Michael Fullen said that having more than six priorities was inversely related to student achievement. You get more than six, you lose your ability to focus. Specificity and measurability. Many of you have done SMART goals. It turns out that the first two elements of that, specific and measurable goals, are highly related to gains in student achievement and monitoring. But note well, everybody monitors. But what they monitor are kids' test scores. What I'm suggesting you monitor is what the adults are doing. How frequently did you have evidence of efficacy? How frequently did you have evidence of prioritization? How frequently did you do collaborative scoring? How frequently did your professional learning communities really address the four questions? Monitoring, in other words, is not just about test scores. It's about what the adults are doing. And how important is this? Let the data speak. The vertical axis here represents gains or losses over the course of three years in elementary, middle, and high school achievement. And you can see that this is not just statistical significance. This is practical significance, dramatic gains in student achievement on the right. On the right means they were great at efficacy, at prioritization, specificity, measurability, monitoring. And on the left, they were not so good in those things. These are the fragmented people with dozens, maybe in some cases, hundreds of priorities. They might as well have none. What about the highest performing schools? Even if you are listening from a very, very high performing school, you can get better if you'll get better at prioritization, if you'll get better at focus, efficacy, and the other areas we discussed. And what if you're serving a very challenged school, the lowest performing schools? Look at this. They had to get really good at those things just to break even because the emphasis in a lot of low performing schools is not to help you get focused, but to pile on one initiative after the other, after the other. And so we've got to really get focused if we're going to have gains in student achievement. The evidence is overwhelming. So that's big idea number one, focus. Focus on a few things. And I've suggested in other writings and presentations that the areas where we need to focus are things like nonfiction writing, collaborative scoring, professional learning communities. Those things really help you. If you get more than six areas, you're losing focus. Now let's shift our attention to feedback. What can you do right now to reduce failures to improve feedback. Our friend John Hattie has done the definitive analysis here. And if you haven't looked at his latest work, please do so. Many of you know the work Visible Learning that looked at 150 variables. He's now up to 240. 
Um, and he used to have 50,000 studies. Now he's at 60,000 studies. And what John has concluded is that collective efficacy by teachers and effective feedback are very strong impacts on student achievement. It doesn't mean that there aren't other factors, including socioeconomic status, that aren't also important. I'm just saying what we're about to talk about matters even more. Now, when we say feedback, a lot of people think that they're giving feedback, but they're not giving what I would call fast feedback, feedback that's fair, accurate, specific, and timely. And so that's what I want to challenge all of us to do, is make sure that feedback is consistent. That's what fairness is all about. That it's accurate, that we're assessing what we think we're assessing. Remember that mathematics example I gave you a moment ago of elaborated problem solving? Why do some kids not do that, even though objectively we think they're pretty good at math? Because we're assessing not just mathematics, but we're assessing English language literacy with numbers in it. So we've got to be very careful when we give feedback to what extent are we assessing mathematics or science or social studies, and to what extent are we actually assessing English language literacy. Let's make sure we're fixing the right problem. It's got to be specific so that kids know what to do. One of the things that drive me crazy is that I'll ask students how they got a grade, and the honest answer is, I don't know, or the teacher likes me, or the teacher didn't like me. It's everything except if I add more supporting details and a better transition, I can move this particular essay from a C to a B or from a B to an A or from a two to a three or three to a four. However you describe it, what we've got to do is give students so specific feedback that they can get better. And finally, it's got to be timely. Most of the feedback that we provide is way too late. Just this week, I was interviewing a principal and learned that all the scores look great in the first nine weeks, and then they look terrible in the second nine weeks. And they were the same kids with the same teachers. I asked, why do you think that happened? And he said, well, everybody doesn't want to give the bad news early, so they kind of delayed giving the bad news until late. That is exactly backwards. We need to give feedback that's timely. If a student has difficulty in understanding things early in the semester, when we have the opportunity to fix it, is the time to do it, not hammering them at the end of the semester after it's too late. So what kind of feedback is most important? I'll tell you, the day-to-day, minute-to-minute feedback we know is really important. but Feedback can support your best ideas. Ineffective feedback can undermine your best ideas. And it's not just the day-to-day -day feedback, it's grades, it's the report cards. That's what people look at. So we've got to remember when we're talking about improving feedback and improving grading, rule number one is be clear about what you're not gonna change. If you wanna have 200 people with pitchforks at your next board meeting, let the word go out that we're gonna change the grading system and all hell will break loose. What I want to suggest respectfully is that you, first of all, engage parents in the community and tell them, yes, we want to improve grades, but let's first talk about what's not going to change. I think you can still have letter grades. I know I depart from some of my friends in the standard space grading community about this, but I think they're fighting the wrong battle to move away from ABCDF toward either uh, letters or numbers. That's the wrong fight. The right fight is to get grades that are fair and accurate and specific. And if your community is comfortable with letter grades, let them keep letter grades. Don't fight that battle. Preserve your political capital for something else. We'll still have transcripts. The rumor is all over the place that if you change your grading system, your kids can't go to college or get scholarships because they won't have transcripts. That's just wrong. Reassure people, we'll still have GPAs, we'll still have transcripts. We'll still have academic honors. Now, if it's up to me, you'll do what the Ivy League does and have highest honors, high honors, and honors, and stop the nonsense that a 3.99995 is better than a 3.99994. And I'll tell you why you ought to change that academic honor system to highest honors, high honors, and honors. That makes it fair and objective. You want to know what the real difference is between the 3.99995 and 3.99994, the difference is maybe who took band and art, so they didn't get a quality point. If you want to be sure to decimate your music and art programs, keep doing that 3.99995 versus 3.99994. Worse yet, some kids have to work in the summertime. I always work in the summertime. I'll bet a lot of you did too. But what about the kids who don't have to work? 
they can take a college class, get quality points, and again, they'll be the 3.99995. And the kid who had to have a summer job, which might have taught him a lot that really helped him in life, is only the 3.99994. So put that aside, those crazy statistical differences, and just have highest honors, high honors, and honors. Faculty can come together and decide objectively what highest honors means. And if you want to say it's 3.9 or 4.0, that's your decision. And if you have nobody meet that, nobody gets highest honors. If you have one person or three people or five people, then they get highest honors. But let it be objective and not the silly statistical distinctions. And of course, we'll still have IEPs. The rumor is out there that grading reform takes away IEPs. That's crazy talk. It's federal law. We'll still have IEPs. So talk about what doesn't change. And then ask your colleagues this question. What's the difference between kids who make high marks like A's and B's and low marks like D's and F's? Or if you're on a numerical system, 90 to 100 versus you know, 0 to 25, or if you're in a standards-based system, the kids who make fours versus ones, whatever it is, take a minute and brainstorm. What's the difference between kids who make the high marks and the low marks? And the answers I almost get are, well, they, uh, they're smarter, they work harder, they have better parent support. Um, they, uh, they have better behavior, uh, they're more focused, they're more engaged, they had more prior knowledge, they had higher reading levels. Just let all these things go on and write them all down and then pull this punchline. Because I've done this experiment with more than 10,000 teachers and administrators. And I gave them a set of marks and said, please tell me what the final grade is. And here is what happened. When you go through this and you might wanna pause your tape right now to be able to write down these 10 grades. They got a C in the quiz, a C in homework, they missed an assignment, then a D on homework, a C in homework, a B in the midterm, missed a homework and missed a quiz, got a B on homework and an A in the final. And I ask people, now look at these 10 grades and calculate the final score. If you have a computer that does it, do what your computer would do. If you've got a personal system, use your personal system. And here's what happens. It might be an A, or a B, or a C, or a D, or an F. Now, a minute ago, everybody said the difference between the A and B kid and the D and F kid was parental support or intelligence or prior knowledge or work. No, it isn't. The difference between the A and B kid and the D and F kid is simply the individual grading system of the teacher. It's not performance because this is the same kid with the same parents and the same prior knowledge and the same work completion and the same reading ability and the same everything who might have gotten an A or a B or a C or a D or an F. Friends, that is not fair. If, if you think that's okay, that's like sending one of your athletic teams to an away game and your host team at the other school says, um, actually, we've changed the rule book. We've changed the dimensions of the field. We've changed the shape of the ball. We've changed the number of players it can play. And we've got our own officials playing because after all, if you're going to play in our classroom, we'll make our own rules. If that strikes you as crazy talk for an athletic contest, it is equally crazy if a kid goes through a seven period day and has seven different grading systems. And that is exactly what's happening right now. What would happen in the context of sports if the rules changed all the time and nobody knew what the rules were, kids would stop playing the game. And friends, I'm telling you, you have kids who have checked out right now. They've stopped playing the game and that's your DF list that's gonna come up the next time you look at it. So if we don't get grading right, nothing else matters. You can spend all the time you want on curriculum and on academic standards and all that stuff. It doesn't matter if you don't get the grading system right. So I'm not asking for big overhauls. As I said, you can keep traditional ABCDF grades. What you don't have to do is the silly zero to 100. It's just an antiquated, crazy 20th century way of evaluating student achievement. A, B, C, D, and F is plenty. If you want to have pluses and minuses good on you, but that's plenty of differentiation, you can't make the case that an 83 is different from an 82. It's just the distinction without a difference. Moreover, on that 100 point system, the zero is the death penalty. And I think not turning work in is bad, but it's probably not worth the death penalty. Get rid of the average. Use the latest and best evidence to identify students. You know why the average is bad? Because you've always had students, and maybe you were a student, who had a breakthrough. 
And when you have that breakthrough, you want to be evaluated at the stage of the breakthrough, not the average between where you struggled early on and the breakthrough. Minimize or eliminate the weighting of homework. I know very high performing schools that have stopped grading homework because the evidence is overwhelming. Homework doesn't help. Homework is irrelevant. Homework does not support student learning. And what we ought to be doing is yes, giving students practice, but the right kind of practice. Practice with interaction, practice with coaching, practice with feedback, practice with differentiation. Consider an early final exam. If you're listening to this before your final exams have been scheduled, instead of punishing kids for late work, how about incentives for early work? When I've seen this, it dramatically improves student performance. So some reassurances before we leave this topic. We're all on the same side. We want students to have academic success. We want them to have personal responsibility. And the reason a lot of people favor antiquated grading system is we want to teach them responsibility. If you believe that, my friends, then you should be able to say, having tried Fs and zeros for missing work, to teach them personal responsibility for the last 50 years, then this year we have the best on-time student work ever. I don't hear anybody saying that. What I hear them saying is that in the 51st year of this experiment, we still have work that's late, kids are still irresponsible, so I'd like to continue the same practices I've done for the previous 50 years. Don't do that. We all want student success, but let's do it right. And that is getting our consequences right in a correct way. So remember, you can maintain ABCDF grades and you can have your traditional grades. A is a four, B is a three, C is a two, D is a one, F is a zero, the way we've always been doing it. You'll still have transcripts. You'll still have academic honors. You'll still have IEPs. So the gold standard is grades are a piece of the feedback system. They're so clear that kids can predict their own grades and they're consistent with external assessments. You know, it's not just the low grades that I'm concerned about. It's the high grades. It's not just the kid who gets a, a five on an AP exam and a D in the class because they missed some work. Obviously that work was not very relevant. It's the other way around. Kids who get A's in the class, but a one or a two on the AP exam showing that they were being rewarded for being compliant and quiet, but they really couldn't do the work demanded on the external exam. Now, there are many things that you can do. Don't walk away from this webinar thinking that I'm easy on kids. You can have any of these solutions that you see in front of you that I'll describe briefly. And if you'd like to talk more about it, I'll be happy to detail it more uh, with you. The catch-up solution is what one school used to every single Friday. If work's not squared away by Thursday night, Friday morning, you go to the catch-up room and you catch up. Would it have been better if they got work at home? Sure. Would have been better if they had a two-parent family. Would have been better if their parents were interested in school and put their work in the refrigerator door and gave them a nutritious breakfast. That, that would have been better too, but they didn't have it. So they got the work, they got caught up, and they dramatically reduced student failure. Another school did the red, yellow, green system where if your work squared away, you're on the green list. If you're missing a couple assignments, you're yellow, you're missing so many assignments, you're in danger of losing credit, you're on the red list. And what happens if you're yellow or red? People look in your backpack. Kids hate that. How badly do they hate adults looking at their backpack if they're on the yellow or the red list? In this school of about 1,700 kids, the first semester they used the red, yellow, green system, 180 fewer course failures. Another school uses the quiet table at lunch. If you're not squared away at work, then you sit at the quiet table, ultimately expanded to the quiet room. Uh, they actually had kids volunteering to do this. Another school did coach's corner where they'd sit in the gym floor to get work done. Now, I'm not telling you what you ought to do. I'm just suggesting that all of these solutions are better than the Fs and zeros as a consequence for missing work. Now, what about the tough stuff? Cheating and plagiarism. It's at a 20 year high. I know kids who have signed honor codes that don't know what plagiarism is because they had an older sibling cut and paste their way to the honor roll. So we've got to talk to them about the difference between plagiarism and not plagiarism is oftentimes just appropriate citation. So early on, I know elementary school teachers who are helping children learn how to say, according to Dr. Samantha Jones on this date in this source, and then they quote it because they know that if you're going to use somebody else's words, that's their property. And kids intuitively understand this notion of stealing. I can't steal their words. I've got to give them credit for it. That's 
how you avoid plagiarism. And if you catch somebody plagiarism, the plagiarizing, then the solution, it seems to me, is make them do it right. Make them do it over again with appropriate citation. Cheating is another important issue. You probably saw the same ASCD survey that I did that I thought was stunning. And that is, if you ask kids, is cheating okay? Of course, they'll say no. And then they had a series of questions that followed it. Well, what about if your friend is really stressed out? Then would you let her uh, copy your paper? Fewer kids say that cheating is bad. Well, what, what if your friend's parents are getting a divorce and she didn't sleep last night? Then more kids say cheating is okay. And what if your friend threatens to harm herself? Then more kids say that it's okay. We've got to equip our students to be able to react to threats of harm and anxiety and stress without thinking that cheating is the answer. Group projects, the best thing I'm seeing here is where students, instead of the classical dividing up a project, are given credit for the feedback that they give to their fellow students. So it is proof positive that the that the work of the entire group was better than the group of the individuals within it. And a menu system. If they mess up one project, don't have them do it again. Teachers are tired of endless retakes. Have them choose something else from the menu to demonstrate uh, their proficiency. And I've elaborated upon this in the book, Elements of Grading. So what about these students here? The students who are earning honor roll grades, not proficient. I looked at ninth and 10th grade students in a large sample, and here's what I found. Uh, the vast majority of these kids who were earning honor roll grades but were not proficient were our young women. And that's no rap on them, uh, but I'm very concerned. If you're the parent of daughters as I am, you ought to be really concerned about daughters who are being rewarded not for proficiency, but for being quiet and compliant and getting along. What's the evidence? Nationwide, our girls are outperforming boys in the National Honor Society two to one. Now, I admit our girls are slightly outperforming boys in English language arts. The difference is the other way around in science and math. That doesn't explain a two to one ratio here. This is all about girls outgrading boys, not outperforming boys. And we really have to pay attention to it. And around the country, I'm seeing similar things. In Minnesota, Marshall High School, 70% young women. Missouri, 80% young women. Um, the national data, as I say, are, are two to one. So let's talk briefly about engagement. Here's a big nationwide study of 900,000 students. Only half of them are engaged. That means they're not only faking it, paying attention, as so many kids do when I walk into their class, but only half of them are really intellectually engaged. They're, they're curious about what's going on. They can tell you what's happening next. Almost a third are not engaged and a fifth actively disengaged, making the learning environment terrible for everybody. So what happens? Take a look at this chart. Take a minute to think about what's the difference between on the left-hand side where the same kids and the same families in the same neighborhoods are engaged in the right-hand side where only a third of them are engaged. A lot of people when they look at these data suggest to me that on the left-hand side, you've got very solid relationships, but as we fragment those relationships, fewer and fewer students know who their teachers are, fewer teachers know who their students are, because the load as we go from left to right becomes more and more crushing. And that is the price we pay for the so-called efficiency of the factory model that we've got. People tell me that relationships are one of the most important things that leads to better student achievement. The chart you see before you is proof positive of how we take the relationships right out of the equation of student engagement and academic achievement. And why is that important? because kids who are engaged are five times more likely to report doing well in school, twice as likely to attend a four, two and four year college. If engagement, academic excellence, and post-secondary opportunities are important to you, then you've got to pay attention to student engagement. And why is that our responsibility? Because a substantial number of our young people don't believe the model of success that you believe. Everybody I'm talking to on this webinar is college educated. In fact, I'll bet a lot of you were the first generation in your family to go to college. You knew that your hard work paid off, that your success was related to effort. But 70% of adolescents say success is not related to effort. They disagree with that. 79%, almost 80% disagree with the statement, it's important to be flexible and adaptable. You know what your causes of success were, but your adolescent students do not. 
So these are the things that we've got to work on. We've got to get better and better at behavioral engagement, emotional engagement, cognitive engagement. In a different webinar, I'll elaborate on each one of these. So I'll just give you one taste of where the research take, tells us. Where do kids have high levels of engagement in your school? I almost always hear people say, well, it's, it's where they're active. It's where they have an opportunity to participate with other kids, where they uh, have social reinforcement. And where is, do we find that? Hardly ever during the academic classroom. We find it in extracurricular activities. And as you look at this chart, look at the left-hand side. When you go from zero activities to one to two, that's a rocket ship. If you want to have something as you listen to this webinar that you could do immediately to improve student performance and reduce failures, increase the number of students in extracurricular activities. But you've got to be strategic. Go after the disengaged kids who are involved in zero and get them involved in one or two. Because look at the right-hand side. Does it do any good to go from four to five to six to seven to eight to nine? That's just resume decoration. We've got to focus on the left-hand side. But I want to respectfully challenge you. Are your coaches, are your club advisors going after the disengaged kids involved in nothing and inviting them to their teams, their clubs, the school play? Or do they go after the person who's already involved in several things and getting them involved in more? Let the evidence speak for itself. So these are the things that motivate kids. Choice, but not unbridled choice, choice within boundaries. They've got to have a sense of hope that tomorrow is better than today. And most of all, they've got to be competent. You want to have one thing that will send an adolescent straight to the abyss of disengagement, feeling stupid. Why do they play video games again and again? Because they're good at it. And they didn't get good because somebody patted them on the head. They got good because they tried and failed. They tried and failed, tried and failed. And each time they got a little bit better, a little bit better. I aspire to have my math class, whether I'm teaching uh, middle school algebra or graduate level statistics, I aspire to have those classes be like a good video game where kids who initially fail get better and better and better. So here's the gold standard. Gold standard practice means they get coaching and immediate feedback like they get from a video game. They're slightly outside their comfort zone. The game keeps getting a little more complicated, not overwhelmingly complicated, but a little bit tougher. They have very specific goals. They don't get to perfection, but they can get better each time. Ask a great football coach. Ask a great music director. They have goals for every practice session. Students give their full attention. You never see these kids multitask when they're at a basketball practice. You never see them on their cell phones when they're playing the violin in the orchestra. They're always giving it their full attention and it's incremental and differentiated. If, if you wanna have gold standard practice, do these things and try to tell me that any homework assignment that we think is practice ever meets any of these standards for gold standard practice. Almost all homework, in fact, the, the great journal Educational Leadership uh, says fails that. I'm so indebted to Ms. Neeson for this splendid synthesis of 37 studies where she basically concluded there is zero impact in grades K through five, stop assigning it. There's limited impact in six through 12. And yet my friends, back to the subject of this webinar, why are most kids getting D's and F's in your school for missing homework, even though the evidence says the homework doesn't matter? We're punishing them we're giving them Ds and Fs for things that do not help their ultimate level of achievement. And this is uncomfortable research for people for whom homework worked very well. After all, everybody in your building on the faculty got a college degree. School was successful for them. They knew how to do homework. So I ask you this, what percentage of your students do you expect to become public school educators and administrators? If the answer is south of 100%, then please don't try to use the same motivational techniques that work for your faculty and your administrators. They're different kids with different motivation and homework doesn't work. So some final thoughts on leadership decision-making. There's really three levels, teacher discretion, teacher leader collaboration, like you do in your professional learning communities and top-down leadership decisions. Now, if I were to ask you, where do most decisions happen? I know what you're thinking. Most things are top-down leadership, and then a little collaboration and a tiny little sliver of discretion. Indeed, when I surveyed teachers about their perceptions, that's exactly what they said. Only 4% is discretion, 
22% collaboration, and almost three-fourths were those top-down leadership decisions. So I created an experiment to identify minute-to-minute decision-making by teachers and administrators. And I learned that the reality departs from this perception significantly. In fact, type one, teacher discretion, is almost 10 times what teachers thought. It's 39%. Now I admit, if you used to have 100% discretion and now you only have 39%, maybe it feels like 4%, but friends, it's not 4%. It's almost 40% where we make the decisions. And then a little more than a third is type two, collaboration. If you're organized as a professional learning community, and I hope you are, then a central part of that is common formative assessments. That means we all agree, same subject, same grade level, what the assessment will be. And then about 27%, yes, are top-down leadership decisions. And I'm okay with that. As a teacher, I'm okay if my principal makes some top-down decisions as long as I know about it in advance. What drives teachers crazy is thinking that they have discretion and then finding out months later that it was top-down or collaborative, or thinking that they had to do something one way, and then learning you had discretion all along. So tell us what the decision structure is up front. What's discretionary? What's collaborative? What's top-down? And when it comes to top-down decision, my recommendation is focus on safety. You don't vote on fire drills. You don't vote on crosswalk safety. Safety is top-down and values. Values are top-down. If you believe in fairness, for example, then you're not going to believe in wildly inconsistent grading systems. If you believe in rationality and and accuracy, you're not going to accept systems that are inaccurate and unfair. So just be really clear about what safety is and value is and make those top down. Otherwise, it's collaborative or discretionary. So these are the keys. Focus, six or fewer things. Feedback particularly getting grading systems right. You don't have to overhaul everything, but friends, at least get rid of the average. At least go back to the old-fashioned ABCDF system and get rid of the 100-point system. Student engagement and clarity on decisions. You get those things right, you will have fewer failures right now. Now, I'm going to give you an opportunity for questions, but I want to make sure that I reiterate my invitation to you for the June 2019 Leadership Summit in Boston, Mass., in Back Bay. We'd love to have you join us there and uh, uh, take a look at that. You can go to the QR code or go to creativeleadership.net. And I'm going to take a moment right now to answer your questions. So give me just one moment. Ah, this is really a thoughtful question. What's a system to ensure that uh, that teachers are implementing uh, these kind of systems? So I've, I've seen a couple of things. Um, when it comes to grading, for example, if you want to make sure you're not using the average and your computerized grading system defaults to that, I think administrators can do two things. Number one, before the grades come out, not afterwards, before the grades come out, every DNF ought to be explained. And you want to have the opportunity to say, hey, if I've got a student who's getting a D or an F due to missing work, is there an opportunity to get that missing work done or better yet, to show proficiency? When students can get proficient grades on final exams and are still failing the class due to missing work, that proves that missing work was not relevant to proficiency. And grading them down for that missing work is nothing more than vengeance. It's just a power grab. What we ought to be evaluating them for is, is, how, is, is what their final score is. The average is a primitive, mathematically inaccurate way to evaluate students. So make sure that we're using our professional judgment at the end of the year, not automatically defaulting to the DNF. Moreover, I'm a big advocate when it comes to monitoring implementation. Don't, don't make the same mistake with teachers that we make with students, which is to hammer them at the end of the year. It's too late. All throughout the year, we ought to follow Kim Marshall's advice to have many observations, 10 or 15 minutes. And if I see 15 minutes go by without student engagement, without student feedback, without teacher-student interaction, then I have the opportunity to intervene immediately, every week or two, on 
what students do best. And, and by the way, when you do these observations, don't just observe teachers who are struggling. Observe your very best teachers. Observe teachers in, in music and in the arts and in physical education. That'll remind you of what great feedback looks like. Uh, on the Marshall Memo website, you'll also find really helpful one-page easy observation instruments. So that's how I think you can monitor effective impl implementation. You said, what is a system uh, to have parents understand the situation on homework? Well, you're exactly right. Parents do demand homework in many cases because after all, they turned out so well and that's what they want. So I don't mean to be flip about it. I understand parents want it. So first of all, whenever I go into your school system, I always respectfully request, let me speak to your parents. Have, a, have an evening meeting the night before professional development or have a morning breakfast and invite them in. And I'll tell them, you know, I'm not the boogeyman. I'm a parent too. So I completely understand your concerns. And once we are on the same side, then I can say, if you want kids to work at home, number one, how about reading aloud to you? That's one of the best things they can do. How about writing thank you notes for gifts that they received that they haven't thanked Aunt Betty for uh, for a long time? How about reading things together as a family that they're genuinely interested in? Uh, how about preparing a meal with you? How about interviewing a grandparent or a great grandparent and writing up that interview as part of your family history? There are so many great family activities that you can do that don't involve doing the odd numbered math problems one through 30. So let them do things together. And finally, as a splendid MIT professor has said in the great book, uh, The Art of Wasting Time, let them play. Let them play, let them skin their knees, let them go to the park, let them have a game that is not organized by twice as many adults as the children involved. Um, we, I, I heard this great expression the other day. You've all heard of helicopter parents? Well, that's bad enough where they kind of hover over them, but even worse is the lawnmower parent, the parent who goes before the child to make sure they never run into any rocks, never run into any obstacles, never have a disagreement. And those lawnmower parents are setting these kids up for calamity on the job, in college, in technical school. And so honestly, parents, let your kids play and let them work out some difficulties alone. That's one of the best things that you can do for them. When it comes to the practice on math, let me handle that. I'll handle the math and the physics and the, and the English practice during class when I can give them differentiated and immediate feedback. So that's my honest answer. And I know it's not a very popular one, but I, won, I just know it's one that we've got to be willing to hear. So uh, I've got my contact number up there. I put it up there for a reason because uh, those of you who know me know I absolutely respond, uh, both in the United States and around the world. I respond by video conference, respond with calls, respond with emails, um, and I'd love to be on site and to visit your districts. I'd love to see you in Boston as well. But if neither of those are possible, you can still get personal, one-to-one uh, -one support because my colleagues and I really believe in what we're doing. Thanks for listening. Have a great rest of the week.